So today we are going to talk about how design tokens empower multi-brand design system. Why this topic? So um, this topic is an opportunity to get an idea of the positive impact a design, to a design system can have for a multi-brand organization. So we know design systems help reach brand consistency on a brand level. And we know design tokens are at the core of every design system. And we know many organizations are working hard setting up design systems to power all of their different subbrands. And for the last year, I've had many discussions with different organizations, including multi-brand ones. And they all add and still have one thing in common. They seek brand consistency. And resources on design system, design tokens, design APIs, and multi-brand are in the wild. However, I couldn't find anything about all of them in the, I couldn't find any material about all of them. So after last year edition, Sylvia and I uh, kept in touch and we both thought it would be a great idea to share with you, uh, yeah, about this topic. So buckle up and uh, enjoy the right folks. So what's in store for us today? So first we will see what are design tokens, uh, sorry, what are multi-brand design systems. And then we will see how different brand models, architecture are shaping the design systems. And then we will see what is a design API and we will end with a demo of a design API. So what are multi-brand design system? And first of all, what does multi-brand even mean? So a multi-brand organization is basically an organization owning several products and or services that are all branded. So many enterprise companies have a big product portfolio. So you, you may think of Google, Atlassian, Microsoft, Amazon, Volkswagen that you will, you, you will be able to learn um, during this conference, so in, in a few days. And, um, and yeah, so there are many companies having a big product pro portfolio. And that portfolio might also stretch across multiple brands and platforms. So this portfolio could be multi-product, multi-brand, and multi-platforms. And sometimes it's even the three at once. So, okay, nice. We understand that there are several brands that can live under the same roof, but how do we ensure a consistent experience across the whole product portfolio? And within the same portfolio, how independent are sub-brands from one to another? So to sum things up, we have three different brand architecture models for multi-brand organizations. And you can see them and we will uh, describe them now. So the first one is called the branding house. So um, it's a model also called umbrella brand model. And in this model, the firm is the brand. It's a collective of complementary brands that cater to unique audiences, but they benefit from shared equity under the same umbrella. So for instance, we have Google. So I didn't, uh, I didn't put all Google products and services here, but you get the idea. You also have General Electric and Atlassian, Atlassian, which is also a company owning several products. And the second one is called the House of Brands model. So in, to, in opposition to the first one, in this second brand strategy model, the branding is focused on the subset brands. So the primary brand gets little or no attention. And basically it's an assortment of brands that benefit from a strategic or operational alliance but they may serve customers in different ways without an obvious connection for the consumer. So for instance, uh, you may know all of these sub brands, but you may not know that they are part of a larger organization, which is Unilever. And the same thing can be applied for this organization, uh, which owns many brands. So you know all of these, you may know many of those uh, sub brands, but they are part of the same house of brands, which is PNG. And finally, we have a third model, which is called the hybrid model. So the hybrid model 
it, it aims to incorporate elements of both the branded house and the house of brands models to give each brand the maximum advantage. So hybrid brand model is often the results of acquisition, acquisitions. For instance, uh, Microsoft, they have several brands, products, or companies. So for instance, you may think about, okay, Microsoft, they acquired GitHub uh, several years ago, and um, they also have Xbox being Windows, and all, all of the uh, Microsoft Office softwares. And this is kind of hybrid because some brands are living on their own and some others are linked to each other. And you also have Amazon. And so Amazon, you have several products, including Whole Foods, who, which they recently acquired and some other products. Or even, once again, Volkswagen. So Volkswagen, they have um, different brands, but uh, Volkswagen is the name of the master company, master organization, and is also one of the sub brand with aligned with uh, other companies such as Audi, Porsche, extra. So you can tweak um, a design system to make it adapt to multi-brand. So you can tweak on many different visual levels like typography, image heart directions, um, tone and bows, animations, audio guidelines, content density, color subsets, and iconography, for instance. So they may be other levers. However, um, your design system, and we will talk about this later, but your design system is broad enough to allow you to, um, you know, pull a, pull a specific, specific string and um, change only a subset of your visual language. So basically, your branding is like water. So let it soak your products, let it flood your markets, and let it bring life to your whole organization. So now let's see how brand models shape uh, design systems. Whatever rate their type, number of brand or number of products, all organizations are aiming for the same objective, brand consistency. And which obviously leads us to design systems. So what kind of design systems for each brand architecture model? And like always, it depends. But the main idea is to set up a single source of proof for containing as many material as possible. So here's how a design system can adapt to different brand architecture model. So think about your design system as a whole composed of different layers. So the lower layers are the one that are composed of uh, the maximum information. So think about the lower layers as the um, part of the as iceberg, which is submerged. So the first layer we have is the guideline is guidelines. So guidelines, whatever, whatever the products you have, whatever the shape of your design system and whatever your organization, you always have guidelines. And above these guidelines, you have processes. Processes are basically what different teams and what different, um, uh, yeah, uh, product teams can do to build specific products. And above this, you have libraries. And libraries are basically the tip of the iceberg. So this is what you will be able to see um, on the front end side, basically. So um, you could have libraries for uh, design tokens, you could have libraries for components, you could have libraries for many things, including by back end de development. But the main idea is that libraries are the most, are is the la layer of the design system, which is the most specific. So if you take all of these layers together, um, you all of these layers are linked together. And um, in the end, you have different products that can be created thanks to a design system. And I will focus on libraries now and see your libraries as uh, 
a link between your foundation and the call library, which are feeding your product library. Because if you give, once again, if you think a design system as a way to better manage different products, you may want to have different libraries dedicated for all of your different products. So you will have several product libraries, but all of these product libraries are consuming your foundation and your call library. And this is what you can see here is that your foundation is composed of your design tokens, your primitives, and your call library is consuming those foundations. And your, this call library is composed of components of patterns. And these two, these two, uh, yeah, uh, materials, then they help you create specific product libraries that, and each product library can create the end product for the end users. So once you have this in mind, let's go back to our different brand model architectures. So the first one is the branded house. And as you may see, um, all of the sub brands are inheriting from a parent brand identity. And some of them may have a small, uh, may have small identity tweaks or particularities, but most of the brand can be reunited in a single design system. So this design system will be strict and the styles of the components um, cannot be easily overridden. And this is to ensure brand consistency across all of sub brands. So when I say overriding styles on components, some companies may need to structure their components with many props and many uh, options so that the developers using them may uh, change the color, change the border radius, or change something. But um, if you disallow or if you, didn't, if you do not even provide a way for developers to tweak visually those components, then you ensure in a way that those components will always be on brand. And this is something that brand in-house organization would want. The opposite of strict is flexible. Uh, so flexible UI in a design system would enable components to be easily tweakable in a visual way. And then house of brands. So here the branding is focused on sub brands and the primary um, brand gets little or no attention. So every sub brand has its own audience, customers and market. And all sub brands differ on their typography, image art direction, or even tone of voice. And they don't have anything in common. So the better way to handle their branding is for all sub brands to have their own design system or their own product library. And the design system rigidity will vary from one sub-brand to another because like, is, as every sub-brand is different, then um, one, designs, one brand may need to be flexible, whereas the other might not uh, need this. And hybrid. So this will be a mix of the branded house and the house of brand models. And this is why you will find some organization based on this model to have one or more design systems. So this is pretty theoretic, but now we will see examples, real examples in the wide and what happens and how different companies may have done. So here, mm -hmm. okay, sorry, I have, okay, sorry guys, I have to relaunch my slides no it's okay it works okay okay so now uh let's talk of predicts um and predicts is the general electrics design system so general electric quick background about general electric General Electric is a huge multinational involved in many sectors of industry in our daily life. So they make about half the jet engines on the airplanes in the world. They do wind turbines, they do locomotives, they do power plants, 
Um, they do offshore drilling equipment and they even do MIR machines. So in short, they know how to do hardware really well. However, they are not as talented with making software and they used to be not as talented to making software. So in 2010, there was an audit from which General Electric learned that they were amongst among the 15 biggest software companies in the world. And it was a huge surprise to everyone, even for GE's executives. So they decided to improve their software capabilities by building a new center in California to fix this. And the issue they had was a classic big data problem. Their hardware are, are equipped with many sensors and they generate huge amounts of data stored in databases. And they analyze this data to understand how they can better work and better serve their clients and internal um, inter people at General Electric. So basically they asked this question, which was how do you take all of this data and make it useful to people? And because user experience here is really important in this equation. So around 10 UX designer had to establish a system that would serve around 40,000 engineers around the world. So their job was to help designers and developers spread in different teams around, around all of generic editor electrics ecosystem to better work together. And Predix, General Electric's design system, is the result, is the result of this effort. So it serves all person involved in the creation of services dedicated for internal users with the General Electric organization and end customers. So General Electric is um, brand in-house as the brand in-house um, brand uh, architecture model. So here you can see all of the different uh, all of the different brand uh, owned by the General Electric organization and the predict predict design system is serving uh, all of the uh, industrial uh, wealth flow that General Electric's teams have. So um, the predict design system features include a huge amount of documentation and their main target platform is the web. So they don't provide mobile apps uh, at all. They only focus on web. And for maximum flexibility, they use framework agnostic code and they heavily rely on open source framework. And once again, they need flexibility because whatever you are working in um, a specific uh, company owned by General Electric on a specific, uh, uh, with a specific framework or in a specific environment in a factory or something like that, you need to be able to access this data um, gathered from all of the hardware I, pre uh, I talked to you about. So this is why flexibility is really important, is tremendously important for the Predix design system. So they went all in with web components using Google's Polymer framework and their CSS is architecture with SAS. And they also use uh, an open source library to bring their data to life, which is called d3.js. So once again, the framework they use are open source and they can be um, used by whatever framework. Uh, their design components library is based on Sketch. So I didn't find anything related to Figma. And I will just assume that they needed a design software that could be run on premise. And so in conclusion, Predix is a pragmatic answer to an organizational, an organizational need, which is controlling software used by bo both by people within the GE organization and by its end customers. And Predict is built with scalability, reliability, and flexibility in mind. So really hats off to them, huge work. So one brand in, one brand in house and one design system. The next design system we will talk about is Stitch. And Stitch is the 
uh, gap ink design systems. So why Stitch was created? First of all, they had way too many style sheets for all of their sub brands. So the different sub brands of the gap organization are Gap, Banana Republic, Old Navy, Atlita, and Hill City. And all of these different brands were completely independent from each other. And sorry. And uh, they needed, they were a bit stuck on certain things. So too many style sheets, the page load were too, uh, way too long. They didn't share any terminology, uh, making updates to all of the brand, different brands, website and services was really cumbersome. And this resulted in the brand expression, uh, which was hampered. So the way, um, product teams work at Gap is the following. You have different brands and uh, as I told you about, and you have two um, areas where pr product teams are working on. The first one is the brand enablement tools. So basically these are tools enabling associates in their store, understand where the inventory is, what is the different price range uh, changes, and basically tools helping customers purchase their products. And there is also all of the e-commerce experience. And the brand work is separate entities in the Gap Inc. organization. So basically they have their own team, which are marketing teams, creative teams, production teams, and merchandising teams. And Stitch is at the center of all of the uh, gap uh, in organization, but even if this is a house of brands and you have five brands, then Stitch is the result of two design systems. So Stitch is composed of two design systems and one is for the brand enablement tools and then over one for the e-commerce experience. So this enables Gap to test and learn in different areas. So those two design systems are aping those two areas as um, one methodology applied on enablement tools, for instance, can be borrowed and uh, used in e-commerce experience. So you may think at the beginning, okay, but two different design system may be a bit hard to maintain and to, 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 to use on broad level, but in a way, if you, if, you, if you think about it, if you have two different design systems, then you can experience two different, you can experience differently on those two different design systems and those different design systems, they can, they can uh, make the other one evolve because the experience you did on, the, on, on one design system can be applied on the other one potentially. And even if those design systems are different, they face basically the same issues, even if, if they are not applied in the same area. So the same issues are working with, across siloed teams, working with teams that don't speak the same language inside or across those design systems. Uh, contribution, uh, transparency, naming, and adoption. So people in charge of those design systems, they realized that the opportunity to create a cultural shift in their company and how to work differently was much more meaningful. And they realized that the methodology they employed have had a lot to do with shaping collaboration and building trust. We are talking about people here. We are talking about aligning not even hundreds, but thousands of people. And you need to really help different product teams and different people to trust each other and to better collaborate. So their main concern was not to know how many components they had and how much were adopted within the organization. First, they focused on building trust between all of the different product teams within the organization so they could be aligned with each other. And people in charge of those design systems were at the center of all of these different teams. So they had to have the right personality 
to listen and collaborate with everyone. And from my point of view, not all people are suited for such um, a human job. And here, empathy is king, really. Without empathy, you cannot build trust and you cannot shape collaboration. And we sometimes forget about this, but design systems, and once again, design systems is mostly about people. 80% of design system is about people and 20% left are about tooling. So we can talk about tooling as much as we want, but if people are not aligned with each other, this won't be fixed by the best tools we have in the market. This human side have really to be taken into account. So basically, instead of they, they changed a bit the um, uh, language they used internally. So they do not speak about libraries, they speak about shared resources. They do not have standards, they have shared values, on and on. A documentation is a shared language, a roadmap is a shared destination. And personally, I like this way of seeing things because, um, yeah, bringing people together is pretty hard, but when you do it well, it's much more meaningful and it's ha it has way more impact. So some key metrics. Um, they, <laughs> they saved around between 50 and 80% time. So uh, whether it's in design or dev uh, and they could reuse code and design. And so over from years over year, they saved um, at least $2 million uh, uh, return investment is 300%. And most importantly, 100% on brand. And when you are a huge organization and you want to, once again, to reach brand consistency, what being 100% on brand uh, seems like paradise to me. So in conclusion, for a long story short, Gap Inc. was mostly dealing with a creative issue. All of their brands were too constrained and they succeeded to align everyone in the organization around two design systems. So to, um, earlier I told you about potentially if you have a house of brands and with each different brand may have its own design system, Yes, in theory, but in like in many cases, it all depends. So in here, we have a, a perfect example of a huge organization like Gap, which has five brands managed to um, uh, have reach and, and to reach brand consistency for all of its brands with two design systems applied on two different areas. So, Design systems are not just about style guides, component libraries, UI kits, etc. A good design system empowers change in your company culture. And uh, this sentence from Gina Ann, um, yeah, really came into my mind when I was investigating about on um, the um, Stitch design system. So. We just saw how organizations needed alignment, flexibility, and centralization, or even all of those to manage their brand at scale. However, even though that we saw was pretty theoretic, there are still some pragmatic questions remaining. So how do we build a component library that supports dramatically different brand styles? How do you create and maintain several brands at once consistently? So the answer, and you may already have guessed it, is design tokens. And design tokens are a language for communicating intent between different parts of a system. So this is, once again, this, this definition from Ethan Market is pretty theoretic, but um, I, I will not go uh, too deep uh, on design tokens because um, this is not the subject of this talk. Um, but if you think about design tokens, um, they are what 
all of your interfaces are composed of. So if you break down a digital product, a digital product is composed of features, and a feature is composed of interfaces, and interfaces is composed of components, and a component is composed of design tokens. So to make a long story short, design tokens allow product teams to better collaborate and they ensure brand consistency across any platforms because basically design tokens are at the heart of every component you have, whatever their size and whatever, how they are used. So here, for instance, let's take a button. Then a button is composed of many design decisions, background color, shadow, padding, an icon, the typeface, font size, etc. And those design tokens have to be managed in a good way so that your components and your whole branding remains consistent and consistently applied across all of your product portfolio. So if you take, for instance, let's say you, have, you are um, you are a company and you need to, and you, you are supporting uh, three different end platform, which are web, Android, and iOS. Uh, on the left side, you first have to define your visual language and which is represented by your design decisions. Those design decisions are then transformed and uh, defined as design tokens, but a color is not applied in the same way for different environments. So for instance, if you are a web developer, you may want to use a color in a JavaScript object or in CSS or in SAS or with your favorite uh, utility classes framework like Tailwind or anything like this. So once again, a design token, or if, if, if you are an iOS developer, for instance, you define color in another format as well. So design tokens are like um, stem cells. Think about a stem cell is a, a cell that has to be, um, that do not, doesn't have a role yet. And so a design token, it has a purple, but a design token has to be transformed so that purple can be applied is compatible with a specific platform. So design tokens in this way are dynamic. They are not static values. Static values are on our platform specific, but a design token, it's basically, a, I'm a design token, I'm purple and I'm of type color. Okay, I have to be transformed so that I can be applied on different environments. A design token is dynamic. So here, thanks to this, you can understand how design tokens can be applied on different platforms. And this leads us to uh, design API. So if you go back here, your design, your design tokens have to be defined, transformed, and distributed to many different end, plat end platform you are targeting. And this is what uh, here nowadays we are currently facing a certain situation. So uh, I will present you this concept of design API by, by starting with the initial problem our market is currently facing. So crafting cohesive user experiences across several, several platforms is a real challenge. Here, I just explain you once again, this is a theory. It's easy to understand, but uh, once again, as one of my associates told me nowadays, creating components and user interface is easy. The real struggle is about maintaining them. So think of a company you might know or of, or even the company you work for. They may have a button component or want to do a, a very simple rebrand. And this consists in changing all of their buttons color to a new one. So this could last several years and cost millions of dollars. And they have many products and platforms to support, hence this estimation. And 
if all platforms are architectured well, it may only be changing only a few lines of code, but most of the time it's not that simple. And this is why it's often easier for most companies to declare bankruptcy on the apps and start all over again. And this is what we want to fix um, nowadays. So the answer, the answer to this issue is design systems. But uh, a design system, and I like this definition from Nathan Curtis, a design system isn't a project, it's a product serving products. And like any digital product, different people are likely to be involved working in different teams, using different tools and working differently. So the real value of a design system is to allow everyone involved to go in the same direction. And the real value of a design system is to bring people involved closer together. So the design system tells the story of how your organization builds and maintains its digital products. And bringing people together is hard. However, the first start can be to help the tools we use daily communicate better with, every, with other ones. So your design system is as valuable as the trust people have in it. And I say it again, your design system is as valuable as the trust people have in it. If people don't trust your design system, they, go, they, don't, they will not use it. And we all, and once again, it, it all comes down to design system is about people. If you have the best documentation, the best style guide available, but, not, but it's not up to date, it's pointless and people won't use them. So this is why people need to have trust in your design system and building trust is hard. However, um, so it means that uh, keeping your design system in sync is mandatory for your organization. And the best way to keep information up to date is to allow data to navigate freely between the tools within your design system. And the best way to distribute data from one place to another is to use a design, an, an API. So the kind of data I'm referring to now is design data, your visual language, your design decision. Your design decisions is what your branding is composed of. Basically, I'm talking about design tokens. And design tokens are a part, a component of your design system. And as I said, a design system should help different people involved in different teams to better collaborate with each other. So for instance, a design system may serve a design team, an accessibility team, an engineering team, or even a marketing team. But these different teams are using different tools on a daily basis. And what a design API helps you do, sorry, what a design API helps you do is to make design data defined and used in a certain tool be available and exploitable and usable in a different one. So this will enable you to have more flexibility and uh, better autonomy for different teams and different people in, in those teams. So design APIs are the logical evolution of design system and they help your design system stay up to date and strengthen the trust people have in their design system. So, and some people like Matthew Sturm agree with this. So Matt thinks that design APIs are the next step in the evolution of design system. And I personally completely agree with him. So now let's do a demo of a design API. And um, what for this demo, I will show you uh, basically specify. So here, um, uh, so I will share with you uh, how specify can help you manage your brand at scale. So the main idea behind uh, specify 
is to synchronize design data between sources and destinations. And when I, when I say sources and destination, I'm mostly talking about tools. So what I will present you is a simple flow between a designer and a developer to easily synchronize design decisions, design tokens from Figma to GitHub. But as, a, as, a, as shown in this, um, on this image, you could totally ha have different workflows, like you update something in Figma and then your PowerPoint slides get updated. Once again, if different tools are able to talk with each other, then it's, uh, it allows your design decisions and your design tokens to go from one place to another. So um, I'm now in the shoes of designer working for the Intu Design Systems community and already set up a Figma file where I define all the design tokens the Intu Design System brand is using. And for the sake of this demo, I already connected this Figma file to a GitHub repository. Um, to a GitHub repository used for uh, this uh, fake website. So this is a fake website that is using the design tokens of the Intu Design Systems brand. And uh, as you may see, uh, so Thais and, and Celia, this is mostly for you because you are the one who mostly have the brand in mind, but here, this purple is not really um, the good one. And this button, this textile inside of this button is uh, a, bit, uh, a bit too big. So as a designer, I will change this in Figma and change all of this uh, inside uh, GitHub. So here, what I will do is all of the, um, Specify is already connected to this Figma. So here I am in Specify and in this repository, which is called Intu Design Systems, I have color, text size, and fonts. And the colors here, you can see that the color accent here is the purple, which is a bit odd and broken. And this is something that I'm, I will fix alongside with the uh, textile used in the um, uh, in the bottom. So here, what I want to do is basically update this color and this color. Okay, nice. And the body textiles, a textile has to be a change as well. So it's 15 and it's 26. So now I'm the designer, I just changed and fixed my design tokens and I will publish these changes. So specify is, as, as specify is already connected to this Figma file, I have to say to specify, uh, okay, grab those new changes. By default, specify will synchronize uh, information from your, from your sources every 24 hours, but we don't have that much time now. So I will manually synchronize all of this. And as you can see here, this color accent has been changed. And as a developer, now my job as a designer is done. And the only thing I can say now is to warn my developer and say to him, all right, uh, can, you, can you look on your GitHub account? Uh, because on your GitHub repository, there will be a new pull request automatically created by specify. And in this pull request, you can see that, okay, sorry, I changed the text size as well, but I will see the whole repository so that the text style is already, is also updated in the GitHub repository. So here I update, and as you can see here, uh, as a, web dev as a web developer, I don't have to even change manually design tokens in my, in my web project uh, because Specify does it for me in the right format, in the right file, uh, with the right naming convention. So everything is configurable by default inside Specify and I will not show you this today, uh, but basically this is the end result you can have. This is the end workflow you can, um, you can, you can beneficiate from by using specify. So here as a developer, okay, I get an automatic pull request and um, I can review the change. I agree. No, 
and I will, sorry, I will merge. And once this is merged, you will have, so in a few seconds, this will be updated. But yeah, you get the idea. Here, this website is connected to my GitHub repository, thanks to Versal. And um, in a few seconds, this will be updated. Here it is. So the new purple and uh, the new text type. Uh, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, uh, let's hear your questions and feedback. So if you have a hybrid system, is it better to start with one library and add others gradually or split libraries from the start? Once again, it depends, um, depending on the way your different product teams are working within the organization. Some product teams may have, uh, may be able to, to create their own um, library for a specific product or service. And some may not be able to do it for many reasons. So once again, it really, it really depends. But the main, um, the main advice I would give to people starting a design system, whatever the size of their organization, is to think about um, to fix objectives for their design system. So create a design system is not and one objective is, for instance, um, what do you want to achieve with your design system in um, one uh, in one month? And uh, the one objective is not to have um, 100 components uh, inside a component library or a documentation. Basically, you want to, it's like a product. Once again, if you are reason about a design system, the, the same way you reason about your own product, your own digital product. So your own digital product, you have to fix and you have to, to, to create some features because you want to answer a certain need. What is your need as a team or as an organization with your design system? Some may think about, okay, we have to put components first. Mm, may not, some of, some of some teams may prefer having a documentation first and uh, components may not be uh, the main issue. So once again, it really depends, but the most important thing is to have the most, people involved with who are um, able to feed and um, and promote the design systems the design system internally so it's all about people bring people that may be able to feed to build to manage and to promote the design system together so that they are empowered and they are given a mission that is really important for them and after this, uh, promote the design system and uh, you will have people listen to the people consuming their, your design system. So there are many ways of doing this, but um, yeah, sit around the table and talk about what is the main issue, what is thing we could do better as an organization to reach brand consistency, to have a better performance for our uh, web page or something, something like this. It really depends on your needs. So according to your needs, you will build parts of your design system in a certain order. And yeah, 